Hello, my name is Dr. Minde and I'm going to discuss um, the peritoneum in this lecture. So, the uh, it's a serous membrane within the abdominal cavity. It's usually glistening and slippery and lines the abdominal pelvic um, cavity. So, usually it actually invests the viscera. It has um, two components, the parietal, which is outer, it lines the internal surface of the abdominal pelvic wall, and you have the visceral peritoneum that actually invests the, the viscera, like the stomach, the intestines. So both of them are lined by mesothelium, which is simple squamous epithelial lining. So the parietal peritoneum has the same blood and supply and lymphatic drainage, as well as somatic nerve supply as the wall, the abdominal pelvic wall. So it's the same. And just like the overlying skin, this parietal peritoneum is sensitive to pressure, to temperature, to pain, and so on and so forth. So pain from this parietal peritoneum, since it's somatic innervation, the pain is actually localized, except for the inferior part of the central diaphragm, which is from um, innervated by phrenic nerve. So irritation of the central diaphragm, as we have discussed in the lecture series of the thoracic diaphragm, so when you irritate the diaphragm, you get um, referred pain to the shoulder which receives C3, C5 dermatomes. Visceral peritoneum, yeah, actually together with the organs it invests, they have the same blood supply, lymphatic drainage and visceral nerve supply, not somatic. So because it's visceral nerve supply, it's insensitive to touch, heat, cold and laceration and it's stimulated by stretching and chemical irritation. So the pain from visceral peritoneum is actually poorly localized and it will be referred to the dermatomes where um, the dermatomes of spinal fibers. So pain from forgot derivatives, organs that are from forgot derivatives, you will experience the pain in the epigastric region. Yeah. Then pain from the visceral lining midgut derivatives will be referred to the umbilical, umbilical region and from the hindgut to the pubic region. So this picture just shows you whatever lines abdominal pelvic cavity is a um, parietal peritoneum, then whatever is lining the organs is a visceral peritoneum, the blue. So here, this is a visceral peritoneum around the organs. Intraperitoneal organs. So these are the organs that are completely covered by peritoneum, organs that are completely covered by visceral peritoneum. So it really does not mean that they are inside the peritoneal cavity. No. Remember, peritoneal cavity is a space between visceral and uh, parietal peritoneum. So these intraperitoneal organs are actually just covered by visceral peritoneum. So, but you, uh, people use this intraperitoneal term when they're uh, talking of cases where you're injecting substances into the uh, peritoneal cavity. So intraperitoneal organs invaginate into the visceral peritoneum and form a closed sac. So it's like pressing your fist onto an inflated balloon. Extraperitoneal organs or retroperitoneal or subperitoneal organs, these ones are outside the cavity and um, they are external posterior or inferior to the parietal peritoneum. So extraperitoneal are external, retroperitoneal means posterior, subperitoneal means they're inferior to parietal peritoneum. And they're only partially covered by peritoneum, so only one surface. A good example is a kidney. It's uh, They're between parietal peritoneum and posterior abdominal wall, and the parietal peritoneum only covers the anterior surface of the kidney. Another one is the urinary bladder, where the parietal peritoneum only covers its superior surface. So the peritoneal cavity is within the abdominal cavity and it's a potential space between parietal and visceral layers of the peritoneum. So there are really no organs in the peritoneal cavity. It's just a thin film, contains a thin film of peritoneal fluid that contains water, electrolytes and other substances of peritoneal fluid. Lubrication. Remember, viscera are moving via peristalsis, so you need lubrication. And the peritoneum also contains leukocytes and antibodies, so they help to fight infection. So what are, uh, where is the peritoneal fluid absorbed? Mainly through the lymphatic vessels. So we have lymphatic vessels on the inferior surface of the diaphragm that absorb peritoneal fluid. The peritoneal cavity in males is actually completely closed 
yeah there's no communication but in females it there's an opening at the fallopian tube so the peritoneal cavity actually communicates to the exterior of the body through the uterine tubes the uterine cavity and the vagina remember from the vagina to the um, uterus to the fallopian tube is all open and the fallopian tubes open into the peritoneum so this means that it, this communication provides a potential pathway of infection. So infection from outside, from the vagina, can get into the peritoneum. So because of this uh, investigation, we have an investigation called hysterosalpingogram. So when the fallopian tubes are blocked, you can actually pass contrast media into from the vagina to uterus to the fallopian tube and it can help to unblock the fallopian tube and you have the contrast medium actually pouring into the peritoneal cavity. Peritonitis is an inflammation of the uh, peritoneal membranes and it can lead to accumulation of fluid in the peritoneal cavity which is ascites. Ascites can also occur in congestive heart failures or in liver disease where your protein level, albumin levels are low, infections of the peritoneum cause, cause ascites and so on and so forth. Peritoneal adhesions, these occur after peritonitis, okay? So when you have the membranous parts, the peritoneal membranes actually adhere to each other due to inflammation, post-infection or post-surgery. Then um, abdominal paracentesis, when you have accumulation of fluid like in ascites, you can actually uh, put a trocar through the anterior abdomen, anterolateral abdominal wall and draw the fluid out. Peritoneal injections and um, dialysis. You can actually do give injections through the peritoneum because it has a large surface area, and you can also carry out dialysis from the peritoneum because the peritoneum membrane large surface area. Dialysis is just a procedure in patients with kidney failure awaiting kidney transplant. Since the kidney cannot take out toxins, so you put the material you want to use to di dialyze them into the peritoneal cavity so that it's able to sort of soak the toxic substances in the blood since the kidney is not able to eliminate these toxins in kidney failure. So what are the functions of peritoneum? Peritoneum connects organ to organ. It connects organs to abdominal wall and it helps to compartmentalize the organ, hence recesses may also form out of this compartmentalization. Okay, so we have different parts of the peritoneum. You have the mesentery. So mesentery is just double layer of the peritoneum that invaginates. Um, uh, when the peritoneum, um, an organ invaginates onto the peritoneum, you form a mesentery, and it has both visceral and parietal peritoneum. So this mesentery serves as neurovascular pathway so blood vessels and nerves are able to get to the organ from the body wall. And the mesentery also connects the organ to the posterior abdominal wall. So the small intestine mesentery is actually what is commonly referred to as mesentery. But all the other organs also have mesenteries and now we call them mesocolon for the colon, mesogastrium for the stomach, mesoappendix and mesoesophagus. So what are the contents of mesentery, mainly connective tissue, blood vessel, neurovascular structures, fat and connective tissue. So those are the contents of the uh, mesentery. So this image just shows you that's a mesentery connecting small bowel, small intestine to the posterior abdominal wall, but you can also have mesocolon for the transverse colon. You can have mesoappendix, it's not in, showing in this um, image. So this is the mesentery of the small intestines. Again, this just shows you the mesentery. These are the small intestine jejunum. So that's the mesentery connecting them to the posterior abdominal wall. Then you can still appreciate visceral peritoneum around organs and parietal peritoneum with no pelvic wall. Then number two, we have omentum. Omentum is a double-layered extension or fold of the peritoneum. So it's also double-layered and it passes from the stomach and proximal part of duodenum to adjacent organs in the abdominal cavity. So from the stomach and proximal part, we have two types of omentum, greater omentum and lesser omentum. So greater omentum is prominent peritoneal fold. It's very prominent. That's why we call it greater and it hangs like an apron. So from the greater curvature of the stomach, and the proximal part of the duodenum, then it descends and then falls back to attach on the anterior surface of transverse colon. So 
what are the functions of the greater momentum? This is the greater momentum here. Okay, so from a greater uh, curvature of stomach and the proximal part of duodenum, then descend the, the transverse colon and its mesentery. So the greater momentum actually um, prevents the peritoneum of the viscera from adhering to parato peritoneum. Yeah, so the uh, visceral peritoneum will not adhere to parato peritoneum, then it's very mobile. So it moves around with peristalsis. So it allows peristalsis, then it forms adhesions when there's inflammation. So, for example, if there's inflammation of the appendix because of infect and it becomes infected, it goes to wall it off. So you protect other viscera from getting this infection. So you seclude and surround the appendix so that infection does not spread. Then the momentum also cushions abdominal organs against injury. So it will cushion against injury and because it contains fat, insulate against heat loss. The lesser momentum, on the other hand, connects the lesser curvature of the stomach and proximal part of the duodenum to the liver. Here it is. Lesser momentum, lesser curvature of the stomach and proximal part of duodenum connected to the liver. So it connects the stomach to a triad of structures. There's three structures that run between the duodenum and liver in a free age. So that's the common bile duct, portal vein, and hepatic artery. Then we have peritoneal ligaments. These are double layers of peritoneum that connect an organ to another organ. Mesentery was connecting organ to abdominal wall, but peritoneal ligament connects organ to another organ or also to the abdominal wall. So um, the ligaments of the liver, we have falciform ligament that connects the liver to anterior abdominal wall. So this is the falciform ligament here. Then we also have hepatogastric ligament, which is actually the membranous portion of lesser omentum. Hepatogastric ligament. Okay. Um, let me see. We have an image that was showing the hepatogastric ligament. Okay. Let me just continue. When I see, I can't get to the image, I will show you. Then we have hepatoduodenal ligament. Okay, that has the portal triad, portal vein, hepatic artery, and uh, the bio common bile duct. Then, so this hepatogastric and hepatoduodenal ligament are continuous with the lesser momentum. So they are continuous with the lesser momentum, hepatogastric and hepatoduodenal ligament. One is membranous uh, portion of lesser momentum, and the other one is the thickened portion. Okay. So then we go to the ligaments of the stomach. So we have gastrophrenic connecting the stomach to the diaphragm. Gastrophrenic connects the stomach to the diaphragm. You can see it here. This is gastrophrenic. Then there's gastrosplenic connecting the stomach to the spleen. Gastrosplenic. And then there's gastrocolic here. Stomach to the um, transverse colon. So this... Um, The spleen has two peritoneal ligaments, gastrosplenic, which we have seen here, and splenorenal, from the spleen to the kidney. Gastrosplenic and splenorenal ligaments, which is also called linorenal. So this shows you the ligaments of the liver. These are peritoneal ligaments, falciform ligament separating right from left lobe. Then there's left triangular ligament here. And if you check here, this is anterior surface, your falciform ligament connecting liver to anterior abdominal wall. Then these are the coronary. And so you have the, on the right side, the two coronaries meet to form right triangular ligament. And on the left, you still have that, so your left triangular ligament. So right triangular, left triangular, right triangular, left triangular, falciform ligament, and this coronary ligament. Again, false left triangular, right triangular. This is hepatogastric, liver to stomach, hepatoduodenal with the portal triad, gastrosplenic, gastrocolic, and gastrophrenic. Again, this just shows you lenorenal, which is splenorenal. You can appreciate the content of splenorenal ligament. It's carrying the splenic artery. 
Then this is gastrosplenic from stomach to the spleen. It also has its content, the short gastric artery there. So you need to know the ligaments and the content. So hepatoduodenal has portal triad artery and gastrosplenic has 